I love Sacramento. Anybody else love Sacramento? I love where we live. I know you're going to say, let's just remove the politics conversation. I love the location of Sacramento. I love where we are in our state. I love the weather. I love the, the centrally located part. We have mountains and ocean nearby. But there are three things that make living in Sacramento difficult. Number one, allergy season. If you can call it a season, it's more like all year. Number two is wildfire season. That's very difficult. I love our weather. I love hot summers, but man, when it's smoky outside, it's so tough on our lungs and respiratory system. But perhaps the most difficult thing about living in Sacramento is being a Sacramento Kings fan. <laughs> Anybody else with me? The pain and long suffering since that 2001, 2002 season when the Lord shined upon Sacramento and our championship was robbed from us, church. It was robbed from us. But it's been tough. It's been tough being a Sacramento Kings fan. So uh, I did the right thing, and I began to celebrate the success of our neighbors, the Golden State Warriors, <laughs> is what I did. And so, again, I, I, I just decided we're going to welcome them into the family, even though Sacramento is my true love. I joined the bandwagon. Anybody with me? We just jumped. Corey Pruce is with me. We're close. We're close. Celebrate the success of the Warriors. Now, in the midst of this championship run, that they've had and all the success the Warriors have had. I've seen so many bandwagon fans like myself. However, there were two that I knew that were genuine fans, Sam Schweier and Sean Patterson. They were the real deal fans. And Sean grew up in the Bay, and he grew up being a Warriors fan and, and really the, the pain of being a Warriors fan in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. But that being said, when they started to make their playoff run, I got this flash opportunity, flash sale, to go to a Warriors playoff game. So I called Brandon Leon and said, hey, let's buy Sean a ticket and all go and see the Warriors play in the playoffs together. So we got these tickets, and we were destined to go see Sean's first playoff game. So we're excited. And, of course, to get to the, the Oracle Arena where it was in Oakland at the time, you have to take the BART. It's the only way. To get in and out of that arena is impossible. So this was a Friday night, rush hour. It was packed. And we are wall-to-wall -wall in the BART. You ever ridden on the BART before? Back before it was weird with masks and everything. People were really close to you, really tight, invaded all your all personal space. That's how it was on the BART. So we're riding the BART, and there's this gentleman, and he's going person to person asking for money. Now, normally, I would just disregard it unless if there's a God opportunity. In this moment, the Lord said, you're going to give him money and pray for him. I said, oof, okay. So I'm there, and I'm listening. I'm waiting for my turn for him to come up to me. He says, hey, do you got any money? I just need some food to eat. I said, yeah, I'm going to give you money, but first, can I pray for you? He said, what do you mean? I said, can I pray for you real quick? I believe God wants to heal your body. Do you have any pain in your body? He said, no. And then instantly, I get this word of knowledge. I said, what about that pain in your right knee? He said, how did you know that? I said, the Holy Spirit speaks, and he wants to heal your knee. Right now, can I pray for you? He's like, what does that mean? I said, I'm just going to pray out loud, eyes open, and God's going to heal you. And I say, in the name of Jesus, we command all pain to leave in this gentleman's knee. Restore full mobility. Amen. Check your knee out. He moves his knee and says, all the pain is gone. What did you do to my knee? I said, Jesus just came and healed your knee. Now, we're in the small, compacted BART, and when you're in San Francisco, they aren't talking to nobody. So any noise is heard by everybody. Everybody looks immediately at this gentleman. He's like, my knee, it's totally better. It's totally better. And Brandon Leon starts sharing the gospel with this gentleman. So I get this boldness to say, who needs healing? God's healing people right now. If you have pain in your body, come and talk to me. This business guy next to me in this suit, I said, you got pain in your lower back, don't you? He's like, no, with me? No, no. I said, can I pray for you? He said, no, no, don't pray for me. Well, behind me, I hear this voice. This lady says, stop it. Stop it right now. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Did you want prayer, ma'am? She says, no, I don't want prayer. And her husband's there and says, we're sick of you proselytizing in our bus. I said, I'm sorry. That gentleman just got healed, but I'm more than happy to pray. We don't want your prayers, sir. I said, that's fine. I'm sorry to disturb you. I'm so sorry to bother you. Well, as I'm talking to them, arguing with them, right, this woman's in the corner on FaceTime on her phone. She has a Facebook Live. She says, and God's spirit is moving in the BART right now, and people are getting healed, and people are praying. There's revival in the BART right now. So I go over to this lady. I said, hey, ma'am, how are you doing? She said, my name is Mary. You just keep preaching the gospel. You just keep doing what God is doing right now in this BART system. I said, hey, can I pray for you? She said, yes, please. I said, anything specific? She says, I got all kinds of pain in my body. So I started praying for her. I said, you deal with skin conditions? She said, how'd you know? I said, the Holy Spirit is moving right now. And so we start praying. She has all these autoimmune issues. And as I grab her hand, I just get this overwhelming sense of depression. I said, you, you've been contemplating taking your life. And she just breaks in tears. 
lead her through a prayer of repentance. She had some serious loss in her family. The Holy Spirit is there and meeting her. And I get this, this strange picture of a gentleman I'd prayed for years ago that had a particular condition. I said, do you, do you have MRSA? She said, no. And all of a sudden, the guy next to me goes, I have MRSA. Can you pray for me? <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So I start to, I said, let's, let's pray for you right now. As I go to grab this gentleman's hand, the people behind us put their hand on his shoulders. This older couple, they're Christians, and they start praying in tongues over this gentleman. So, Lord, we command all sickness to leave this man's body, and they give me this look. I said, oh, and your Warriors fans, God bless you. She says, you keep doing what you're doing, son. You know, they're in their late 70s. I said, can I pray for you for anything? They said, our son is in deep drug addiction. Can you pray for our son? So we start praying for their son. I then send my other friend, Brandon, to pray for this guy right here now with the MRSA. As we're praying for them, the Holy Spirit shows up and begin to prophesy and pray for their son's deliverance. And I look over to my left. Our other friend, Brandon, who was with us, is now witnessing to the couple that first told us to stop proselytizing in the bus. And he's praying for them. So we finally arrive to our spot here at the Oracle Arena. As we're there, we're about to get out. I just get this sense. There's someone here with migraines. Say, Who here has migraines? Who has migraines? This man runs up and says, my wife does. Can you pray for her? Here's her business card. So I take the business card, walk out, call, leave a voicemail, get a text the next day. Thank you so much. All the pain's gone in my head. Come on. We were just going to a basketball game, friends. See, there's these moments when the Holy Spirit shows up, and there ain't no stopping what the Holy Spirit's doing. And it's really this awareness that he wants us to have. And there's no superhero moment. Any of us would have done that. But when God brings unusual boldness to proclaim the gospel, we cannot be afraid of the consequences on the other side. We cannot be afraid of the consequences on the other side. And what we're going to learn in this story today is that Paul and Silas enter into obedience with persecution. And guys, here's the reality. I would love to tell you that the Lord's going to give you a word of knowledge at work that won't cost you your job, but it might. I would love to say that the, word might give, the Lord might give you something at school and you still might get in trouble. But it's worth the risk. My favorite quote says, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Faith always entails risk. And I believe as we're asking for revival in our church and in our city, there's tremendous cost that comes with it. You have to understand Whenever they begin to move in power, what rises at the same time? The religious spirit. It comes both in the church and in the culture. And so as we're praying for God to move and stir things, get ready to be uncomfortable. Get ready for things to come against you, but at the same time, we have a good God that will deliver us in the midst of opposition. Amen? Philippians, or not Philippians, the church of Philippi, Acts 16, verse 6. Let's read this together. It says this, then they went to the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak a word in Asia. It's Paul and Silas here. Verse 7, and when they had come opposite to Mycenae, they attempted to go to another place, hard to pronounce, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. This is a verse that is often skipped over. But here's something we have to understand. Not all closed doors are the enemy. We have a double, double thing here. The Holy Spirit, and then only time we see this in Scripture, the Spirit of Jesus. So here's the thing. Paul is so motivated and so driven to preach the gospel, he tells Barnabas his plans in Acts 15, and the Lord says no. So much so that the Holy Spirit's shutting doors. He ain't getting the attention. Jesus shows up and says, you ain't going there. It's not the assignment. It's not what you're called to. Not all closed doors are the enemy. And one of the hardest journeys we have as believers is learning to wait on God for what his plan is. Any impatient people out there? So impatient. Type A types, you know what I mean. We want to see God's mission accomplished for him on our time, not his. He's really good at his kingdom work. He's really good. And he's so kind, he wants you to be a part of it but he doesn't need your plan and your timing. He doesn't need you to accomplish his mission. He wants you to be a part of it. And I think one of the greatest living examples we have of waiting on God is the DMV. 
I think the DMV is the greatest living expression. If you want to learn what it means to wait on God, go to the DMV without an appointment. You know, you show up there, you get there early, and the line is out the door every time. And you walk inside and they have those two lines. You have the one that says appointment only that is always empty because no one can get an appointment. (laughs) Our registration's expired. Okay, come see us in five months. It's not going to be helpful. And then you go to the non-scheduled appointment line which goes out the door. You finally go there and you get that blessed number. You know that number? You get B41. B41's handed you and you hold that ticket like it's a lottery ticket and you are praying. For the Lord to call your number in the DMV. And finally you hear that B40. You know? You know that number? B40. And you're waiting. You're like, I'm next. And next you hear is C39. And you're like, no C39. No C. And then it goes backwards. B37. You're like, no, wrong way. And eventually that number is called. And that person has the power to ruin or bless your day. You know that. I think the DMV is the greatest living expression of waiting on God, except for his organization is not disorganized. But he holds the pass for you to move forward. And we ha- if we're praying for revival, we have to learn to wait and stop. Holy Spirit, give us an awareness. And what happens is as they finally stop, they get this vision. And I'll probably just for the notes team, I'll probably just tell this more as a story today. As they're there, they get this vision, this man of Macedonia saying, come to Macedonia, come and help us. It's this vision in the night. Now, I'm convinced this was not a normal way God would speak to Paul. If we're asking for the Holy Spirit to show up, he's going to speak to you in ways that are not familiar. So if we're praying for the Lord to show up, maybe dreams is your thing, get get ready. It might be through poetry. It might be through journaling he speaks to you. If you're the journal type, it might be dreams and visions. You never know. And I have known this, and I just want to say this. I have an unusual amount of people coming to me and saying, I'm having dreams where the Lord's speaking to me tonight. That's a God season, church. I was at a pastor's meeting on Tuesday. One of the pastors came and said, hey, I'm here today because last night I had a dream that you told me I was going to be late. And if I didn't show up, I would miss what God had. It's a pretty good dream. (laughs) God's speaking to people that this is not normal for them to hear in this way. This Holy Spirit heightened time and season he has for us. So they arrive in Philippi. Philippi is this massive city. It's this main bank region. Okay, here's a picture of what Philippi would have looked like. It was founded in 350 B.C. It was known as the City of Fountains. So amazing water sources were here. There was gold mines all around it. So this became the main economic center of the region of Macedonia. In addition, the main deity they would worship was the god Zeus. Thunderbolt, lightning, that god. That was the god they worshipped. Whilst Paul's there, he's directed to the riverside. And what this communicates is this. There's a place of prayer on the riverside. It means in culture that there was not ten Jewish men to establish a synagogue in that city. So this is an incredibly Gentile city. There's very few Jews, if any at all, and he comes across this place of prayer, and the reason they're by the riverside is this is the only place they're granted permission to pray for a God outside the pantheon, okay? So you're not allowed to be able to pray or have places of worship in the city for gods outside the Greek pantheon. So they're there, and he meets this woman named Lydia in this place of prayer. So Paul's there, begins to tell them about the Messiah, and here's this description of Lydia. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us, and she was from the city of Thyatira, and it was a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what Paul had said. And when she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. I love that word. It means this, to use force to accomplish something. Lydia is incredibly persuasive, but here's the key thing, not in a sexual spirit. She's persuasive. She has influence, but not in a sexual way. And it goes on to describe this, this this gift of salesmanship that she has, this incredible influence that Lydia has. In a few small verses, it gives us her whole resume. Here's what one scholar says. Lydia owns her own business and her own home. She's a dealer in purple cloth from Thyatira, a city well known for textile industry. We find this in Revelation chapter 2. Purple clothing was destined for the rich and royal in the Roman world, where it symbolized power and influence. A merchant in purple cloth then is someone who rubs shoulders daily with societies rich and famous. The simplest way to put it is this. 
Lydia is an influencer. She would have had a massive social media following. There's no way around it. Lydia is so instrumental. She's a God-fearer, but she converts over to Christianity. And this is what I really felt for the Lord. I don't have time to go into this. This is not to trigger a debate. The place of the spouse or the wife in the relationship is significant. And this is not a statement to determine that staying at home versus working in the marketplace has any different value system in God's economy. They're both valuable. They're both important. But what I want to talk about this morning is assignment. And what I felt was this. There are many women here where you've been suppressing ideas and creativity in business in your heart because you felt you've not been released by the Lord to follow that assignment. And what I felt this morning is there was females here and online that are called to be entrepreneurs, and you've been suppressing that desire, but the Lord says today's the day for that to be released in your life. The Lord wants to release boldness in the marketplace, and I felt in particular we're called to release that as a church. And this is not a statement about complementarian versus egalitarian. Get that business out of your life right now. That's the religious spirit. But there is calling and assignment. And for some of you, you've been focused on raising your children at home, and that's been a beautiful thing. But now your kids are at age where God wants to release you in the marketplace again. So eyes closed. You felt that call right now. You are a female that is called to be in business in the marketplace. Lift your hand if that's you. Stand up, ladies, right now. Stand up if that's you. I did that. That was a trick. That's called a trick right there. Church, expand your hands toward them right now. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for release in the marketplace. A release to do business and to raise kingdom wealth, to see your kingdom come. As Lydia did that as a forerunner, as an example, they're called to preach the good news and release your power in the marketplace. We thank you for salvations. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for breakthrough in the board suites. In Jesus' name, come and have your way. And everybody said, amen, amen. All right, you can sit down now. So Lydia now becomes the first church leader in Philippi. I know that's controversial, but she does. And now she holds this place. And as they're going to her house now in the place of prayer, as Paul's now seeing revival break out in Philippi, there's this slave girl that comes and begins to torment and taunt them. She's fully demonized. So she's known as this fortune teller. And now we don't see this in scripture because this is cultural, but I could not believe how they described what this woman did and what spirit she had. One scholar says this, the species of this girl's unholy spirit is literally the Pythian or Python spirit. Isn't that crazy? It's called the Python spirit, and the myth of the dragon that guarded the Delphi oracle. So what they would believe is this, is that when they identified this gift of like prophecy, fortune telling on a girl, they would then bring them into cultic practices, and they would let the Python spirit enter them. And now they would fortune tell for business, and they were sold into slavery. It says the powers are trickier, trickery of this slave girl are apparently extraordinary. She brought her owners a great deal of money from this fortune telling. So here's this girl, she's fully demonized, and she begins to torment and taunt Paul and Silas. It says this goes on for many days. She begins to say, these are slaves of the Most High God, declaring the way of salvation. What's unique, though, is because she's a prophetess or priestess of Zeus, that was also Zeus's title. Now, what's really odd here, and we're not going to make this super theological, is she's declaring truth. They are slaves of the Most High God, but it's in a mocking spirit. And this mocking spirit is create, meant to bring doubt and confusion and fear in the life of the believer. Now, after a few days pass by, Paul sees it and says, I cast you out in the name of Jesus, and she's delivered that hour. So just with words, no long prayer session, no inner healing, with words, she's completely set free. Powerful moment. As a result of this, there's a couple things we can draw. Why did it take Paul days to cast out that spirit? And what we learn is this. It wasn't Paul's assignment until then. Some people talk about Paul's impatience here. No, no, no. Paul was very zealous. He would have cast it out day one. But for a lot of us, we step into things we're not supposed to yet, specifically in the demonic realm where we don't have authority yet. And what we see in the model of Jesus is he only did what he saw, what? The Father doing. So Paul's released and he casts it out and sets that girl free. And this is what I felt this morning. Some of you here are picking fights in the demonic realm that are not meant to be yours. Others are tolerating things that you are meant to take authority over. 
and there is a tormenting spirit in some households here, specifically targeted at your kids, and you as parent intercessors, I felt in particular, there were some moms here that have been taking authority. Men, this is for you. It's time to step into that place as a spiritual leader in your house. And if your kids are not doing well, you need to be in unison with your spouse, believing for freedom in your children. And this is what I feel, prophetic moment right now. The reason why you feel disqualified to do that is because your closet porn addiction. But the Holy Spirit wants to set you free from what you've been bound by. Come talk to one of our leaders and pastors here. There's no shame. See, that's what he tries to do. He tries to silence you with shame. There's freedom on the other side of this. Don't allow that to take away your spiritual position of authority in your house to see your son and your daughter set free. It's important. So Holy Spirit, just eyes closed right now. We pray for freedom and healing in the households. We ask for mothers and fathers to take authority over that mocking spirit in the house. And we say no more in Jesus' name. That spirit of torment, just eyes closed. You've been in a place where you felt torment in your dream life. You felt torment in your house where there's an unusual assault against your family. Lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we declare that assignment to be closed in Jesus' name. No more. The assignment, the assault against marriages, we say no more in Jesus' name. Or even right now, I feel like for some moms here, you're, you're resentful towards your husband not leading in that way. It's time to pray for him, not resent him. So Holy Spirit, we pray for forgiveness and grace in those relationships. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Cast this spirit out. Paul and Silas were then dragged before the magistrates of the city. And I love this phrase. It says, these men are disturbing our city. And this is what that means, to bring into a state of confusion. We are called to disturb darkness, church. And so that was a place, that was a stronghold that had not been disturbed before. They break into that city. They start setting people free. Don't worry, Pastor John, it gets better, I promise you. No, just kidding. <laughs> I love you. He's going to another church. I got it. He is going to another church to preach. That's what, that's what I meant. The Holy Spirit comes into that city and wreaks havoc on the spirit of darkness. They have no words for it. And they actually make it a racial issue, which we don't have ways to talk about that right now. So these men are Jews. See, the enemy loves to point out the thing that actually isn't the issue. He tries to disqualify you around things that actually aren't the issue. It's the Spirit of God. And many of you are receiving the spirit of rejection about things that actually aren't the argument. It's because of the Spirit of God inside of you. And they make it a race issue. Paul and Silas taken on the chin, and they're thrown in prison, not just any place, the innermost cell. Oh, to top it off, they're beaten and flogged for this. A lot of you think, man, if I'm obedient to God, it equals my promotion. In the spirit, not in culture. When you say yes to Jesus, guess what? It actually comes with tremendous cost. Jesus' discipleship program was not rich in fame. It was carry your cross, follow me, which means to die. It's tough. And so they're thrown in the innermost cell, bruised, bloody, literally bloody. And their friends are rats and cockroaches. Not kidding you. This is a dirty dungeon. This is where murderers and rapists would go. That's who was sent to that place. And as they're there, what is their response? Oh, that does not look right. Don't drop your Bible when you're preaching. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Mark. Love you, man. This is their response, verse 25. You can bring that piano in. Thank you, Howard. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Don't you love that? They're in the innermost place, and they're not complaining, they're not angry. They're not yelling at God. Why are we here? We did the right thing. They begin to sing a song to the Lord. And all those around them, this isn't one or two, there's many, hear the song in their suffering. See, there's a song the Lord wants to write in you in the midst of your suffering. And what it's been in this season is a spirit of complaint the spirit of bitterness. But the Lord is doing something in you, and it's that song of suffering that results in sanctification, church. It's how holiness is produced, how we're created in His image and likeness, and they begin to sing. And I'm just reminded of this psalm, Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit 
out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps secure. And he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and many will fear and put their trust in him. I wrote this down. I felt this was for some of you. A new song isn't an old song. A lot of you have been singing old songs in your heart when the Lord wants to write a new song for you. And he wants you to invite him into the place of suffering with you. Because guess what? He did too. We don't have this Savior that's high and mighty. We have one that became weak and feeble and died on the cross for our behalf. And as he's there, they sing this song and suddenly this earthquake breaks open. And I cannot stand how people try to justify the, well, actually, the circumstantial evidence is that this, this earthquake comes. No, this is a Holy Spirit earthquake. Don't scientify this. The Holy Spirit comes in because here's why we know all the shackles are broken off. Your song sets people free, church. This song of suffering becomes a song of salvation. But there's such holy reverence that here's the symbolism. Not one prisoner escapes because they know this is far more than them being set free in the natural. There's a spiritual freedom that's coming. And they're there and they're in awe. And then you have the jailer come and he takes a sword to kill himself because he knows what it is. And then Paul shouts, don't do it. We're all here. It says he shouts loudly. He shouts boldly. And this is what I felt. There are so many that are bound in darkness in this season, specifically coming out of the pandemic, where the spirit of depression and suicide is trying to kill and torment so many. Your voice matters. You can't be silent anymore. And I really want to challenge you as a church this whole week. When the Lord prompts you to send a message to somebody, do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. You don't know what's on the other side of that call, that message. And don't start it off with, I know this might be weird. Just say the word of the Lord. I haven't spoken to him since high school. Oh, well. They already think you're weird. It's fine. Just give the word of the Lord. Your words matter. What do you have to lose? They can lose their life. You have life and power in that tongue. And this is what I love. When he shouts it out, I love it what the jailer says. He calls for lights. Capture that. He's in darkness. He calls for light. You are the light of the world. The city set on a hill. The city is calling for light. Not the false light of culture, the real light of truth. As he calls for light, Paul leads them to the Lord and his entire family gets baptized, church. And guess whose house they join? Oh, Lydia's house. So now you have this fashion designer and a jailer that started church. Sounds like a pretty dynamic speaking team. That's what I would say. And here's what I love. Final point here. It says that they came and washed their wounds. Church, your call to reach the lost isn't just for their healing, but yours as well. And there's a restorative reciprocal work that happens when you begin to help those in need with the light of the gospel. It brings healing to the old wounds that you had. They're imposed on you. I guarantee that beating was worth it for the salvation on the other side. And what the enemy meant for imprisonment turned out to someone else's freedom. That's our call as a church today. He's called us to take ground and see light and fire and grace and freedom and true genuine revival. Let me say it, church. It may not mean these services are full, but if we have a hundred houses filled with those that are new believers, sign me up for that church.